evening and welcome to the New Mexico Philharmonic's Wednesday Night Live. Tonight, I will speak with Jennifer Frauchi, wonderful violinist from California originally, but she went to Harvard, New England Conservatory, Juilliard, and she has performed the solos all over the world with such orchestras as the Chicago Symphony, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and of course, our own New Mexico Philharmonic. We'll start our show tonight by watching a video of Jennifer perform uh, Lily Boulanger's De Montagne de Printemps. Thank you. 
is my great pleasure to introduce my guest for tonight's show, Jennifer Frauchi. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening. So great to see you, Roberto. Wonderful to see you too. Thank you so much for participating in our Wednesday Night Live. And um, that was a beautiful piece by by Lily Boulanger. Tell me a little bit about uh, that work. So uh, Lily Boulanger uh, was the sister of the perhaps more well-known this day, to this day um, Nadia Boulanger, who taught many of our composers in America who went to Paris to study um, counterpoint and theory and harmony with her. Uh, but uh, Lily Boulanger was a great talent who was composing um, in her late teens and early 20s um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And she wrote three wonderful pieces for violin and piano. Um, this is the um, uh, longer of the th- longest of the three. And I discovered these works when I was a student at Juilliard. Um, my boyfriend at the time happened to be going through the Juilliard library and came across these uh, these pieces. And he copied them and bound them and gave them as a gift to me. And it was really a great gift because it was a wonderful discovery. And so I've, I you know, played them when I was at Juilliard. And um, at the beginning of the season, I, I pulled them back out after a long really, hiatus. And, yeah. Really beautiful. I didn't know these pieces. And we know so little about uh, Lili Bolice. Of course, Nadia, as you mentioned, was the famous uh, composer and uh, teacher. And funny thing is that we both studied at Juilliard and I know that Juilliard's solfege department is all based on Paris conservatories, uh, solfege techniques, which was uh, mostly developed by uh, Nadia Boulanger. And I guess we had some of the same teachers at Juilliard, Miss um, Cox or Miss Scott. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The, that yeah. was one of the best classes I ever had the opportunities you have. I loved it. Well, they were very rigorous. And, uh, you know, I came to Juilliard with, I had a naturally good ear, but actually very little ear training. I didn't have any ear training as a teenager. Um, and then my studies before I got to Juilliard were at Harvard, where I was in the, I did study some um, music, but I was not a music major. So uh, it was, yeah, a revelation to be in those courses, which, as you say, yeah, there's this rigor that was kind of, um, uh, brought from the, the Boulanger school. And uh, by the way, this piece that I, I um, just performed <laughs> um, is orchestrated. And so it's, really? uh, yeah, it would be, uh, and it's wonderful in its orchestration because you get the full range of colors with the different orchestral instruments. So it's something that might be interesting for you to, to look at for orchestra as well. I definitely love to take a look at it. So you were born in Pasadena, California. But right. um, you did most of your training on the East Coast, uh, including New England Conservatory, Harvard, uh, later Juilliard. Uh, and um, how was that, um, uh, that, that phase of your life um, coming to the East Coast? Well, I, I did train until I was 18, for the most part in Los Angeles, actually, with um, uh, the last six years were uh, with great violin pedagogue named Robert Lipset, who teaches at the mm-hmm. Colburn School, which um, in its current formation as a conservatory did not exist when I was growing up. Um, that conservatory was built and came um, to life after I left LA, actually. Uh, but I was very lucky to grow up in a place like LA, which has a very uh, rich history of um, you know musical history like Heifetz moved there and Scher- Arnold Schoenberg moved there and Grigor Piatigorsky and all these you know great uh, musicians moved there uh, many of them after uh, World War II or during World War II or in the lead up to it um, and there are also uh, all these wonderful studio musicians who were fantastic instrumentalists who you hear in all these all old school that was the kind of the, the atmosphere I grew up in. And then I was also very lucky to uh, find this teacher, Robert Lipset. Um, but going back east, initial first to Boston when I was 18, and then when I was 21 or 22, I moved to New York and, and studied at Juilliard, uh, was, was quite a shock, not musically speaking, but in other ways, culturally, there's quite a difference. And um, you know, musically, there is the same 
um, you know, access to in Boston and New York, I mean, maybe even more so than in LA, you know, great orchestras and a wealth of great musicians. Um, but uh, I, I think actually the, the biggest adjustment was was more weather. <laughs> right. Weather related. Oh. Uh, you know, like in New Mexico, you have weather that's somewhat more similar or analogous to what we have in Southern California. And uh, although you might have, you have colder winters, uh, but yeah, moving. Well, tell me about weather change. I moved from Brazil to New York when I was 14. So that was that's a huge shocking. change. Yeah. <laughs> shocking change, right? But I loved it. Uh, and I still do, you know, I mean, the secret, I think, is to be able to, to enjoy it wherever you are, right? But what the place has to offer. And uh, as you mentioned, New Mexico it has, you know, especially Albuquerque has such beautiful weather and atmosphere, you know. We, uh, we boast that in Albuquerque, you can, um, you can uh, ski in the morning and play golf in the afternoon, you know. <laughs> so it's really fantastic. Yeah, you're lucky to be in such a climate, and I feel very fortunate to have grown up in a climate such as we have um, or had in Southern California. Uh, but I actually mentioned the weather because it did, and it still actually impacts me somewhat as a violinist, <laughs> because when you're dealing with winter weather and when it's extremely cold, um, for someone like myself who um, who has maybe some circulation issues, it's more common with women, um, and this was always the case when I was 18 and, and, and to the current day, um, when it's really cold outside and you have to start playing, it takes so much more time to warm up. And that was right. something that I'd actually never encountered growing up in Los Angeles because the weather is always nice. You know, your limbs, your, your fingers feel normal. Um, and right. so as a student, I just remember, you know, that was kind of a big deal actually, because when I was at Harvard, for example, I was taking lessons at New England Conservatory and there was a bus that would go from um, from Harvard Square in Cambridge over to uh, to where NEC is, which is right around the corner from Symphony Hall where the Boston Symphony plays. And there was a bus called the number one bus. And in the winter, I'd have to stand in the cold, I'd stand outside and wait in the cold and then get on the bus and then get off the bus um, and you know walk through this, this frigid weather that I was not accustomed to and then go to my lesson. And it was, you know, I tried to find a, a space. There wasn't, there weren't really any practice rooms. So I'd maybe find a corner in a bathroom, pull up my violin and try to move my fingers and, and warm up. Um, but then I'd go into my lessons always sounding like utter crap because in the winter, because I was so cold. <laughs> Same thing at Juilliard. I lived on the east side. I'd walk across town, get to Juilliard and have uh, like 7.30 <laughs> or 8.30 a.m. Uh, lessons with my teacher Robert Mann because he was an early bird. Right. He started teaching really, really early, and I mean, at least there I had access to practice room. I tried to warm up, but if in the middle of the winter, you know, it's like, <laughs> I spent so many lessons through my entire education in the winter, sounding bad because I couldn't quite figure out how to warm up, you know, when it was cold. So anyway, that's you know something well, you have to contend with to the same extent when you're in a wonderful climate like you are in New Mexico or in or in LA. It's true. Well, let's watch the next video, which is a very short clip of you playing uh, Beethoven's Sonata Number no. One in D major. So let's watch that. <laughs> Jennifer, I'm always impressed with your perfect intonation. And I love it when every note is just right on. And uh, you mentioned earlier about your, your pitch. You probably have perfect pitch. I do have perfect pitch. And that was something that uh, we discovered in my family when I was very young. And my sister, who's also a professional violinist, uh, and she's four years older, so she started playing before, violin before I did. She has perfect pitch as well. And uh, we, it's, it's 
not clear, but we wonder if it has something to do with the fact that we both started violence so young. Um, mm -hmm. We both started with a Suzuki method, which is very much based on learning everything by ear. You know, you don't learn to um, to read music until until later on in um, your in one's development. So, you know, having been exposed to music from the t from my from birth, and then having started violin when I was maybe two and a half years old. Um, you know, that kind of opens up the, the oral pathways, uh, the, you know, the right. ear. Uh, but, uh, you know, there have been studies done. Is, is uh, perfect pitch is it something you're born with? Is, is it something that's developed? Can you have perfect pitch if you start your musical training much later? Not totally clear. But... Right. I also have an older brother who's an oboist, mm -hmm. and uh, we both have perfect pitch. So, and my father was you know, who's also a conductor, who's always, uh, you know, training us and doing all sorts of games. And uh, it was a lot of fun. But I have to say, I don't know if this happens to you as well. It probably does. Sometimes it's so annoying because any note that is slightly out of pitch, it just annoys you. And it can have the overpowering effect of, uh, you know, just freezing you, right? Um, um, so sometimes you have to turn it off. Yeah, it's Do hard to turn, turn it off, off sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost impossible to, to turn off. And it's, yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I know, when, you know, when I'll be listening to the same performance. We all have the same experience where we might all go to the same restaurant and have very different experiences tasting the same food. Um, but same with performances. Um, you know, you go with friends or you talk to colleagues who hear things in a different way or maybe who don't hear pitch in the same way. And of course, there are performances that I've heard that are incredibly powerful and moving where the, the person playing is playing out of tune. But it's hard for me, unless the, 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 the content of what they're saying or the message that they have to impart with their music is extremely powerful, it's hard to, to not hear bad intonation. But in comparing, you know, talking to other people, I realize there are the people who don't hear it at all. You know they don't process the intonations and i kind of, in a sense i envy them you know when i go to in terms of how you listen um and you well, know i mentioned I, turning it off because you know rehearsing an orchestra sometimes you just have you know you just have one rehearsal to get the entire symphony done and you cannot stop at every note that's out of tune right right you can't uh, turn it forward and and uh so you have to sometimes you know just ignore that or just um allow the musicians to correct themselves and just uh, let them know and just say please fix that and just move on with the rehearsal right <laughs> right but in terms of my own playing and and listening to pitch and to intonation um especially with something like the beethoven which we just heard um you know with classical period music like mozart and, and haydn and, and and schubert um where the intonation does have to be so pure uh I mean, a big part of my philosophy of playing the violin is that you, uh, you know, in, in addition to, uh, or to, to help the emotional content and the, the musical ideas that you're, you're conveying to your audience, um, you want to get the instrument, the violin to ring as much as possible. And there are ways of, of executing that with the bow to get the end of how you hold the instrument. There are so many things that go into it of getting the violin to max to, to maximally resonate. But a key part of that is playing in tune, because if you're not playing chord, like it's the same in the orchestra, if a chord is not truly in tune, or if the violin is not, if you're not playing in tune on the instrument, it's not going to ring actually. So, you know, if you play a chord on the violin, it's out of tune. Um, it's, it dampens actually the, the resonance, the natural resonance of the instrument. So anyway, that's part of you know why I do in my practicing. I'm always listening for intonation because I want to get the violin to ring, and that's part. Oh, we of have a video of Jennifer and her sister performing. What are what's her name? So my sister's name is Laura, and this particular video is I included this because uh, this was recorded a year ago when we were in lockdown, if you remember <laughs> the dark days of a year ago uh, after COVID had hit. And uh, I was living downstairs from my sister and she was you know, literally the only person I could make music with. And so I was very lucky that 
um, you know, we were living in the same uh, building and that we were able to play together a little bit. And so we recorded some Bartok duos and this is, this is one of them. So my sister and I grew up playing the violin together and it's, um, you know, uh, sweet to get to as adults play together as well. Fantastic. Now we get a chance to hear uh, the Bartok violin duo with uh, two sisters with perfect pitch. <laughs> that Jennifer thank you for sharing that with us and your sister it, it she also teaching and performing and a soloist and, uh, so what my, she... my sister is a member of the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra which is a um, conductless ensemble and actually one of the founding members is Guillermo Figueroa who is the former music director right of of your your orchestra uh, so she plays with them and before the pandemic hit, she was subbing basically weekly with the New York Philharmonic and uh, was sometimes subbing in the Met Orchestra as well. And she has a piano trio that she plays in, um, you know, that's this past year, of course, has been a year in which many musicians have been grounded, grounded me <laughs> there uh, or silent. And uh, uh, you know, she, how she, about you? Um, you've been uh, teaching and uh, performing. How how has your life changed uh, since uh, the pandemic? Well, it was very different for, uh, last spring and through last summer when um, really nothing was happening um, other than the fact that I mean, nothing was happening in terms of performance because there were no performances <laughs> anywhere, uh, basically globally. Uh, but I did continue teaching. I'm a violin professor at uh, Stony Brook University, where uh, I teach almost exclusively doctorate st doctoral students, and we have a few master's students. Um, but it's uh, essentially it's a graduate program that I teach in. And uh, last spring was very difficult because in, in the middle of March we went remote, as did all the universities and conservatories in the country. Um, and many of our students are international and some of them stayed through the end of the semester. Many of them flew home. So they scattered around the world to Europe, um, to, to Asia. Um, and then, you know, there, if you remember last summer, there was, you know, a scare with visas and the Trump administration with, mm -hmm. you know, they issued, um, you know, the, one of their manifestos. So um, some of our international students ended up never going home. I mean, have stayed on through now because they were afraid that if they left, they would never be, they would not be allowed back in the country. There was that fear. Um, but anyway, that was very, you know, heartbreaking to see everyone disperse. And some of them came back this past year. Uh, I mean, this past fall or this past spring, even though our department has been entirely remote this, this year. The university is open. Our music department has right. been remote, but um, but in in addition to that, I have since the fall been performing and uh, recording. So there's two things. There's per actual performances where you know you you show up and there there's an audience there. I have been doing some of that because some of that is happening, um, although you know it's a fraction of what what used to be. Um, so I have um, been very fortunate to be able to play for some audiences um, since last August, you know, here and there. And uh, and then also I've been doing a lot of uh, recording and streaming. Some of it is live streaming, like actually literally playing live for an audience that's, uh, you know, 
on the, on their computers um and some of his you know recording a lot of recording that's then streamed later so i'm i i feel so lucky that i've had uh the chance to first of all see my colleagues and my musician friends to actually see them and to be in the same room with them and to get to play music that's been um such a blessing and uh and i feel fortunate to um to be working you know period Absolutely. any musician oh. who's working feels feels fortunate in this time we have this uh, wonderful video of you playing with a student from um from Turkey. It's another one of the duos of uh, Bartok. So let's watch that now. Jennifer, tell us about your student and her story. So as I, I mentioned, our department has been remote, uh, but we have a body of students who live in the New York area, um, some of whom are domestic students, uh, meaning they're, they're American um, and were living in New York. Um, and other international students who opted to to stay in the States and study remotely, or in this particular instance, um, uh, the student is a master student named Aicha Aktogan, and she's our studio TA. Um, she's actually the student of my colleague Hagai Shaham, who's a great violinist, uh, one of our four violin professors. I teach with uh, Hagai Shaham, who comes from Israel, and Phil Setzer, who's one of the violinists of the Emerson String Quartet and French violinist Arno Sussman. So the four of us actually share students. And Aicha is Hagai's student, but she's one of the students I mentioned who last uh, spring opted not to go home to Turkey. There's you know, some unrest there and also strict quarantine measures for people who are returning from, from abroad or from the States. Um, but then there was also the real concern with visa issues of you know if, if she went back, would she be able to come back to the States again? So she, stayed on and hasn't been home to Turkey in two years, actually, and has been living out um, in, on Long Island and, um, you know, has just shown incredible resilience because she's kept practicing and, you know, having her lessons online. I uh, drove out to school last November because I organized um, two concerts on campus because the campus is open. And I gathered a group of students who live in the area to perform. And um, there were eight students, I think, who participated in those two concerts. Uh, and you know, we had um, we streamed it, and then there were live audience because there are people on campus. And I had Aicha come meet me um, mm -hmm. in the studio before the the first performance, and had her play through a couple movements of Bach for me, which I'd heard online. But you know, I had her actually come in person. And after she finished playing she was very kind of uh, i mean she played beautifully but it seemed very shaky and she said so this is november mind you it was right before thanksgiving and she said i haven't played in front of another person since the beginning of march wow and that was uh in a way such a shocking statement and and was <laughs> but a reflection of the times and she's not the only person there are many students who are in that situation and then we went and you know give these performances but that was really for me a wake up call <laughs> of the situation that some of our students were facing. Some of our students, for example, who went back to Asia, who were in Taiwan or who were in Korea, because of you know, the measures that succeeded there, they were able to, to play chamber music or even play, you know, there are orchestral mm -hmm. concerts going on there with audiences. You've seen the videos, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but for, especially for our students who, uh, for example, are in New York where, uh, you know, the um, performances are not allowed and uh, it's hard to get a space to play in. Um, I, you know, I, I really took it as a mission to, for 
the, to, the, to the best that I could to get the students who were around playing chamber music. And so the way, the safest way I found to do that was to organize groups and to play in them myself and then to find the space, you know, large spaces that were well ventilated with opening windows and, you know, uh, sure. Eric is exchanged regularly, all of that. Um, and I, so I had organized several chamber music reading sessions in the fall. Um, but in the spring, I actually ended up this past spring, um, in addition to Aicha, whose master's recital I performed on, this um, mm -hmm. set of Bartek duos, I played in three other groups actually and coached from within. And it was an incredibly gratifying experience because um, first of all, the students were playing chamber music, period, they were playing. <laughs> Second of all, they were so excited to see each other and you know because there's been so much isolation and third i got to connect with them in a way that i'd never had time to before of course you know you teach you teach lessons you teach master classes but it's another thing to sit down and play with your own students oh, yes. and to the extent that i was able to this past um spring uh you know i have been performing regularly but certainly not at the rate i was before you know because there are just so many fewer performances so the fact that i had this time to spend with these students and um and actually engage with them when on you know in this uh sort of as peers even though as, as you know coaching yeah. within the group was incredibly meaningful to me oh congratulations on doing that it's such a wonderful experience i'm sure they will carry that with them for the rest of their lives and uh, they will certainly appreciate that so much and it was really um, of, it was part of how i was trained too when i was 18 19 i um got to go to the hoya summer music festival a uh, chamber of music festival and santa fe chamber music festival where the person who was the artistic director of those two festivals heichiro oyama he's the violist um, and conductor um, he had groups of very high level students who would play with one of the artists playing at the festival. And so it was a similar thing where, you know, there'd be three of us or four of us in a quartet or in a quintet playing with, um, you know, someone like, uh, like himself. He did, he did a lot of this himself and he coached from within the group. And that was really how I got my most meaningful chamber music experience, which translates to everything, to solo playing, to orchestra playing. Because it's, it's that setting where you really learn to really listen to all the voices around you, and you know you learn how to shape phrases, and you know. Have. Well, speaking of solo playing, we have one more video. It's a very short video. It really makes you want to listen to more, uh, which is the the Sibelius Violin Concerto, and uh, it's such a beautiful performance. Uh, where was that recorded, uh, Jennifer? So this was recorded last October in Florida uh, with the Brevard Symphony and Chris Confessori mm -hmm. is the conductor of that orchestra. And this was really a shocker for me because my uh, agent, Bill, called me in July or August and said, so this orchestra is going forward with the performances in the fall um, and they want to do, you know, are you okay with flying down there? And, and playing Sibelius. And I was like, Sibelius, that's a full orchestra. <laughs> Did I hear right. it correctly? Because uh, many orchestras were not playing at all, as, as we know. And then those orchestras that were uh, programming for the fall were all doing either only strings or, you know, like Mozart concerti, two, two oboes, two horns, you know, that kind of thing. And so I was quite shocked, but I mean, that really has to do with, with uh, state politics and the fact that uh, Florida mm -hmm. is a Republican state and there um, you know, were many fewer restrictions. And so you know, each arts organization there was kind of, uh, uh, it was up to them to come up with their own um, you know, uh, regulations um, and determine if they should proceed or not. So it was, um, I have had several orchestral solo appearances this season, but that was the first one. And it was really uh, quite um, at first strange, I have to say, because uh, it was a full orchestra distance on the stage. So not as many strings as before, but there were still, I think, over 50 people on stage. Mm -hmm. And um, but because of the distance, uh, and every, you know, I'm wearing a mask, which uh, uh, 
does affect how you hear when you play the violin, any instrument actually, but you know, because the mask covered the jawbone and I do hear partly through the jawbone in contact with the violin, right. actually. So that affects hearing. And then, you know, there, there's kind of the mask pulling on the ears. And so that affects the hearing, but also because of the distance. When we started playing the Sibelius, I remember being so disoriented because I couldn't hear anything because wow. everyone was so far away. <laughs> Um, but because that was without audience and because they were filming it, um, I actually turned in and then I could see very clearly both the conductor and the string section and the winds. So that actually, you know, when you can see them, it helps you to hear. So I adjusted, but I remember how disoriented I was when at the first rehearsal and we started playing because I mean, first, I of, all, first of all, I hadn't played with orchestra since before um, before March. Actually, it was the first week of March that, and then from the second week on, everything was canceled. Canceled. So it already been quite a, a bit of time. So it was shocking to see actually that many people together. <laughs> I was like, "What are all these people doing together in the same place, in the same room? Like, what's going on?" Uh, but yeah, but starting to play, it was like you know we've all had to adjust in so many different ways, and one of them is how to listen when people are so far apart and you're masked because it affects how you hear your own instrument. So. Well, that's such a beautiful piece. I love it so much. Perhaps that would be your next concerto with uh, the New Mexico Philharmonic, right? I would love that. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jennifer, for participating in this show. Uh, love to see you again in Albuquerque. And uh, so let's hope it's Sibelius or another great concerto. Hope to uh, be soon. Let's watch this video and we'll say goodbye Everyone, thank you for joining us. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next week.